Today is October 20th, 2010. I am Karen Aronson. We are speaking this afternoon with John S. Reed, who was elected chairman of the MIT Corporation this year. He has been a member of the corporation since 1980 and a life member since 1985. He has served on the corporation's membership, investment, and development committees, as well as on numerous visiting committees. He was born in the United States, but grew up in Argentina and Brazil, and he served in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Korea. He holds bachelor's degrees from both MIT and Washington and Jefferson College, and a master's degree from MIT's Sloan School of Management. Much of his career was spent at Citibank and Citicorp, where he rose to chief executive and chairman, and he was later co-chairman of the successor entity, Citigroup. He was tapped as interim chairman and then became chairman of the New York Stock Exchange during a difficult period of its existence and has been a member of numerous corporate and nonprofit boards and advisory groups, including Monsanto, Philip Morris, the Rand Corporation, the National Bureau of Economic Research, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and the Boston Symphony Orchestra. John, thank you for talking with us today. Happy to do it. Some people have suggested that higher education in America could face the same fate as the auto industry. Do you share this concern, either about American higher ed generally or about MIT in particular? Yes, uh, it's a real concern. Uh, it's funny, a member of the corporation here at MIT approached me not long ago, maybe a couple weeks ago, and said, John, we may not exist in a couple of years. And I said, why? And he said, look, it costs approximately $50,000 a year to get an education of the sort that we offer, and that would be true at Harvard or Stanford or what have you. Uh, that's an awful lot of money. I mean, you're talking about, you know, the annual income of the typical family in the United States. And clearly, it would be possible, say, for India, just randomly choosing, they speak English, et cetera, et cetera, to offer a first-class engineering education for substantially less because the cost of living wage is the whole structure. And the question is, if you could get a fully equivalent education by traveling and living in India for a while, would that begin to attract students away? And the answer would be certainly yes. I mean, I think medical schools in the United States have certainly seen people go overseas to get medical education more cheaply, and then they come back and become licensed in the United States. And engineering particularly, or engineering and science, is a global sort of intellectual activity. And so, one could well imagine that you could create a, an equivalent educational experience, particularly at the undergraduate level, but not necessarily restricted to that, in other locations that were inherently a lot cheaper. And at some point, that could play a factor. Now, am I staying up nights worrying about it? No. But do I have it out there as sort of a model of, hey, what does that say to us about us? Uh, you know, I listened at MIT probably in the late 60s, early 70s, to the chairman of General Motors at the time discounting the foreign car imports, saying that they were small, not particularly profitable vehicles, and that if the foreigners wanted that part of the market, they were welcome to it. I think probably from that talk to today, General Motors lost market share almost every year since. Uh, you know, the world has changed. Uh, the distribution of intellectual talent is getting increasingly widespread. Educational systems around the world are getting better and better. 
Uh, certainly IQ, that is the potential intellectual capability of people, is distributed pretty evenly across the world's population. It's certainly not concentrated only in Cambridge. The unusual circumstances of World War II that resulted in the transfer of a tremendous base of intellectual talent into the U.S. and particularly into the university systems, that circumstance hopefully will not ever exist again. And so people are going to be quite happy to stay in St. Petersburg or to stay in New Delhi or wherever they happen to be if they could pursue their careers and find appropriate things to do and so forth and so on. So I believe that we have to take into account as we worry about MIT and where we're going that we've enjoyed a wonderful period that was somewhat special. Uh, not likely to be repeated, and that the world in which we're going to live over the next 50 or 60 years is going to probably have a different dynamic. And cost is certainly an issue. Uh, I would point out that while it costs $50,000 a year to come here, MIT only gets 20 by the time you get rid of all the student aid and everything. So we are certainly providing an immense amount of support for these students. And by the way, maybe we should provide more because we're going to have to make education reachable by people who aren't of the means to pay the sort of full sticker price. And, but this idea that our educational system is expensive, it's certainly going to be expensive compared to alternatives, and that the talent pool is going to become more dispersed and the nature of our educational product is pretty globalized. It's not like teaching American history, which would be difficult to do in a country outside of the United States. Uh, so yes, I think we should regard ourselves as being in the same competitive situation as the U.S. auto industry was 20 or 30 years ago. At one point when you were chairman of Citicorp, it faced enormous problems. You've said that you thought about whether to step down at that time, I think it was the early 90s, but decided to remain because you were the right guy to deal with them. MIT doesn't have problems like that at this point, but what makes you the right guy to be MIT's chairman at this time? What ah, do you think? Now there's a question for you. Uh, I have no assurances that I am the right person because obviously there are people who might be here. I don't know who they are. I could speak to what maybe I could try to do, but I certainly can't tell you that there aren't three other people who might have a different agenda that might be better for MIT. Uh, the process was simple. Uh, you know, when the, there was a need to find a new chairman uh, because Dana Mead decided that he should retire. Uh, they appointed a search committee. I presume, I don't know, that the search committee said, now what kind of person are we looking for, what sort of thing. Uh, when I was first approached, I found it, I mean, I was pleased. I said, gee, that's an awfully nice thought, but I really didn't think that, you know, I was necessarily the right person, nor that MIT uh, was necessarily the right thing for me to be doing. Uh, but what happened is very simple. Uh, you know, uh, I was asked to at least get engaged, that I probably owed it to MIT, about which I care a lot, uh, to at least consider the thought seriously, and so I did. And the first thing I did is I called Dana, and I said, Dana, tell me what this is all about. And then I talked to Susan. Uh, by the way, I called and got a copy of the bylaws so that I could figure out what the bylaws say the chairman is. And then I spoke to Susan, and I said, hey, what are you looking for in terms of somebody uh, who's chair of the corporation? And of course, the first thing I found was there was no agreement. There was no agreement between the bylaws or the prior incumbent or what Susan was thinking about. And so it was very clear that there are a lot of degrees of freedom in the job and that it could be done in many different kind of ways. Uh, then I did, uh, I met a number of times, probably three times, with Neil Papillardo, who was the chairman of the search committee and a person of deep ties to MIT, and I must say a, a great 
you know, contributor at MIT, you can't go to the physics department without running into laboratory and meeting room and everything else that Neil has made possible. Uh, but Neil and I talked quite a bit, and I, I had never been on the executive committee, and Neil, of course, has been on for a long time. And I said, what's the executive committee thinking about, and so forth and so on. So I sort of triangulated. And the net, and then I met with the search committee, and I told them, I said, look, I'm not here to, for you to decide or me to decide. We're here to explore, and what you should do is probe me to see if I'm sort of what you're looking for, and I'm going to probe you to see if your description of what you're expecting is something that I could sort of identify with. And we had a good discussion, as you might imagine. And at the end, I said to myself, self, I could probably contribute. You know, I, I love the place. Uh, I really do believe that my educational experience here at MIT had a very material impact on my life and how I think and so forth and so on. Uh, my father had gone to school here, so it was sort of something in the family. Uh, and on the other side, you know, I'm a great believer that discourse counts. What you talk about and how you talk about things makes a difference. And I've obviously had a lot to do with running large organizations. And I have not only done it, but I've been on boards and I've thought a lot about it. And so I sense that, you know, I know a little bit about how lar large organizations function. And I felt that I could come and help change the discourse a little bit. There were areas where I think at the senior level, at the corporation level, at the senior administrative level, maybe we don't talk about things in the right way and so forth and so on. And it wasn't that I felt that I would make decisions uh, that would take the corporation in a different direction, but I might be able to get the discourse going in a way that would cause us to make decisions that might be different than we might otherwise have made. And so that's my sort of goal. I mean, I sense that what I can contribute at this particular time is to get the corporation and the corporation members engaged to make sure that we're talking about the right things in the right language. Uh, I sat down with a blank piece of paper and said, hey, what are the responsibilities of a corporate member? And then I sort of said, hey, how can we organize meetings so that a reasonable observer would suggest that the corporate members would have an informed view on these various issues? Uh, because you can't expect the corporation to behave properly if they haven't been talking about the right sets of issues in the right sort of way. and. Uh, so my, my thought was that my contribution might be to help change, modify uh, the discourse, uh, both at the, with the interface between the corporation and the administration. And I felt some competence in terms of that uh, area. And so I said, you know, it, uh, there's no time span. You know, if at the end of a couple of years the executive committee were to say, gee, John, you've really been helpful, but we'd like to change, I'm perfectly comfortable. I would understand that totally. Uh, so it isn't as if I signed a 10-year contract and MIT stuck with me. They aren't. Uh, Any time that either I felt that you know I wasn't being constructive or productive, or if the for some reason the executive committee uh, thought that uh, we'd quite happily do something else, and so that's the basis on which I came in. And as I say, I can't tell you that there weren't four people who might have been better. Engagement is an interesting concept. You were on the corporation for many years and then stepped up your participation at some point. And I assume that there are lots of members of the corporation who go through similar processes at their times of their life when they can be more engaged in times that are less uh, good in that way. How do you think about it? I mean, do you well, think you can make people more engaged than they are? What yeah, are some of your thoughts? Yeah, because I agree with you 100%. I mean, engagement is a function of what else you're doing. Uh, 
And obviously, in some circumstances, it's very difficult to get engaged because you are, you know, fully occupied with other right. things. Uh, but on the other hand, it depends a lot on whether things are served up in such a way that that you feel your voice makes a difference and so forth and so on. And I must say, during some of my years on the corporation, my interest was the same, but the discourse was such that you just didn't feel you had much to contribute. And so I didn't. I could have. but. It wasn't that way. And it was funny, uh, I, as you mentioned, I was on the board of Philip Morris for a long time, maybe 35 years, I don't know. And I think we had seven different chairmen during my period there, uh, Joe Coleman being the first. And I can remember going to one of the chairmen, the, either the third or fourth, I forget who, and saying, I've never gone to more boring, less useful meetings. Now, the company was the same. The business we were in was the same. But he simply ran the meetings in such a way that the board members didn't feel like they had much to contribute, or maybe they did so after the meeting quietly in the halls. But the point is, and yet, Joe Coleman, who was the first person who put me in, I don't know if you ever met Joe, but he was a wonderful, engaging human being, now unfortunately not alive. But Joe had that wonderful facility, uh, which Ronald Reagan had, by the way, of causing everybody to feel that you were the only person and that your views were really important and that he was just waiting to hear what your views were. And needless to say, his board was engaged. And I don't think he necessarily did everything that we talked about, but you knew you had the point of view, you were being listened to. And I once had an occasion to go to the White House, and Mr. Reagan, the president at the time, was asking a number of corporate types uh, our opinion about some subject. And he had this ability to cause each person to think that he really was listening to their point of view. And then it was funny, at the end of the meeting, he thanked us profusely for being there, blah, blah, blah. And he said, by the way, I'm not going to do what you all have recommended. And uh, so there we were. We felt important. We felt that we were there for a good purpose, and yet he was kind enough. Most politicians would have let us go, and then we would have discovered over time that he wasn't going to do it. But he just said, uh, you know, I basically haven't been persuaded. And uh, But th the point is engagement, some of the members of the corporation are not going to get engaged because they're busy. They have other things to do and so forth and so on. And as you know, attendance is not perfect. We have 75 members. Typical meeting will have 50 maybe. And so you've got, you know, a third that are floating around. Uh, but if the discourse is right, then you draw out that engagement. Does MIT look any different to you now that you're four months into the job and have led your first corporation meeting and sat through some visiting committees and probably a bunch of other meetings? Yeah, it does, uh, but not substantially. I mean, it's obviously much more textured, and I have a much more detailed understanding of things, and I've gotten to know an awful lot of people who I did not know before, and each one of them is different in his or her own way. Uh, and I certainly, you know, I have a greater sense of how Susan and Raphael spend their time and so forth and so on, none of which I had any reason to know before. But the basic enterprise, no. The basic enterprise, you know, we're an immensely important research organization that teaches, and our teaching very much surrounds the research. I mean, at the graduate level, you couldn't teach without the research. Uh, and at the undergraduate level, we still get students amazingly involved in, in the actual research kind of stuff. And that appreciation I had before, uh, the quality of the place, the word excellence. There are very, very few institutions that I've known that could use the word excellence honestly and, and have it resonate uh, as if people, yeah, that's real. Uh, and that was always here. It's very visible when you're the chair. 
so I haven't, it hasn't in any serious way changed my impression of MIT. It has caused me to be much more familiar with details. How about the job as chairman? You did a lot of research. You talked to Dana. You read the, the, the small print. You talked to Do, Does that job look? Any different from what you yeah, expected? Yeah, I'm more engaged, to use my own word. Uh, you do get caught up in sets of things that I did not anticipate getting caught up in. I mean, there there's a lot of process that needs to be worked on and a lot of talking. Uh, and, you know, I've, uh, I've gotten into buildings to a level that I never would have imagined. Uh, you know, I know all about deferred maintenance, uh, you know, building by building by building. I have sheaths of paper. Uh, I also, by the way, I read all of the material that's prepared for the visiting committees. And that, of course, allows me to see for each unit the uh, level of detail that when you're on the corporation you see for those committees on which you happen to sit, but not for the others. Uh, but yeah, there's there's more detail uh, than I might have imagined. Uh, but my sense, you know, four months into the job is I'm learning a lot uh, from time to time. I think I'm helping occasionally. And my sense is, you know, it's going to turn out to be potentially useful uh, to the Institute, I hope. Uh, and presumably it'll turn out to be fun, and I'll get a better balance. You, you can't say no to anything when you're new. You have to do it once before you say, gee, I really didn't need to do that. And that'll come in my second year. I'll, I'll begin to get some <laughs> control. What else does the chairman do? How much of the job is fundraising, social events, and what are the other pieces? Well, the you know you have ceremonial obligations. You you have what I call external ceremonial and internal ceremonial. There are things like I'm going to a black tie dinner at the end of the month, which is an external ceremonial thing where one of our corporation members is being honored. And since he's a corporation member and a great person, it's I think appropriate that I be there. Uh, I. You have tried to duck some of the internal ceremonial on the theory that that is mainly Susan and Raphael's territory, that if uh, one of our faculty members wins a Nobel Prize, which one did, uh, I think it's primarily Susan and Raphael who should celebrate that and not the chairman of the corporation, even though I'm pleased as punch. Uh, but it seems to me that from a positioning point of view, the internal ceremonial I am less engaged in. Uh, fundraising, I made clear from the beginning, I'm not a good fundraiser. You know, I have from time to time asked people to may give money, and I don't have that wonderful twinkle that causes people to immediately reach into their pocket. Uh, I could help organize and think about fundraising, and clearly that's going to be an important part of my job. The two things that I'm going to have to really work on is to try to help think about how best to organize to fundraise and how to position. I mean, fundraising is marketing to some degree. And you got to cause people to feel good about giving and to want to give, to think giving makes sense. That's true of institutions as well, by the way. Uh, you got to ask yourself, why do some of the big uh, corporations not feel some need to make sure that the engineers that they hire from us that are trained, I mean Intel, Boeing, so forth and so on, they live off our product, our students. It would be nice if they would help support these students as they're being developed and formed. We do a wonderful job for them. We, through the admissions process, we sort them out. We give them a wonderful education. And then they're available in the workforce. And we net our cash short throughout that process. 
you know, I estimate that we're cash short about $15,000 per student. And it would be nice if the people who hired them and got the benefit of all of the sorting and training that we've done on their behalf. And so you, maybe we could find a way of motivating people to be supportive because we pay a, an immensely important role in, in finding and training these people. Uh, but anyway, so I'm going to have to work to try to help. I mean, we have a lot of pros and we have a lot of experienced people in this arena, but still our needs are significant. And my guess is we're not going to be able to raise the capital that we need from the sources that are well developed. We're going to have to broaden and amplify and maybe intensify. So helping organize, think about position fundraising, I think is something I'm, it's not my favorite subject but it's something that I think I should do. The other is investment. Uh, you know, if you look at the big research universities in the United States, most of the growth of their endowment, and hence their capacity, uh, comes from the return on their portfolio, not from new monies coming in. It's been the investment returns on the existing mm -hmm. portfolio. And so Seth and I have spent a fair amount of time together because I've said to him, I've said, Seth, how much money are you going to earn for us in the next 10 years? Needless to say, he doesn't have a very solid answer. Uh, but we got to think hard about that. Uh, we, it makes a big difference. Uh, if we could earn an extra percent or two, that's material. And so, and I've said to Susan, I've said, Susan, you know, our evolutionary pathway is going to be defined by our financial position. Uh, and our financial position is derived from only two things. One is what we could earn on our existing money, and number two, what we can raise in terms of new money. We've been living off our existing physical plant, and we've probably run that one out. I mean, we're having to renew our plant. And I would estimate that, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, We've probably extracted a couple of billion dollars worth of value out of our existing plant. I, see, when we take depreciation, we don't put that money away in a kitty that's separate from the endowment and so forth and so on. Uh, that money disappears. It's an accounting entry, but there is no cash. And the result is we currently have a lot of pretty well depreciated buildings that we've been living in as if they were free. Uh, and so to some extent we're living on historic investments that we've made and as you could see on campus we've had to start making some new investments. You know we have a new Sloan School, we have a new media lab, we're about to open a new cancer center and we have to renovate the existing buildings. So you know, it seems to me that talking about investment returns, fundraising, and our capital situation, these, these are things that are part of my job. If I like it or don't like it, it just turns out to be what's important. Is MIT about to start taking care of some of the deferred maintenance? Or? Yes, but not at a pace that if you really were tough-minded, we add more to the deferred maintenance each year than we take out. How different do you think your approach and your priorities will be from that of your predecessor, from Dana, or from his predecessors? I think we all change with time. I mean, uh, some of our priorities will be the same. You know, when I talked to Paul Gray, for example, Paul said, John, your most important job is who is on the corporation. In other words, my role as chairman of the nominating, I, the, you don't call it nominating, it's uh, the equivalent membership. of the membership committee. I chair the membership committee. And uh, Paul said that will turn out to be your greatest contribution, who you add to the board and so forth and so on. Uh, if that's true, Dana had the same, and his predecessor, uh, Darbalov, had the same, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we all have the same fiduciary responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the board and on the executive committee and so forth and so on. Uh, 
I can't speak to what their priorities were. I think that uh, Darbalov particularly was a good fundraiser. You know, he has extracted various large sums of money from me, and so I know all about being on the other end of it. In a somewhat uh, better economic climate? It was a better economic climate, but he was good at it. And he liked it, by the way. He, if he were alive, uh, you know, I'm sorry that Alex isn't, but were he to be alive, he would judge me strictly on the number of very wealthy people who I got to, you know, support us. Because he was really good at it and he enjoyed it. Uh, and so his priorities and mine would be a little different in that regard. Uh, but I would guess that the overlap of prior chairmen certainly in excess of 60 percent, and then the 40 is probably a function of the particular circumstances of the mm -hmm. times. You know, I don't know who was chairman when Howard Johnson was president and the students were running around, you know, burning the place down, but whoever it was clearly had a very different set of priorities than any of his successors. Uh, so. Besides the question of endowment return and the depreciation or maintenance, what do you think are the other big challenges facing MIT at this point, and, and how would you assess MIT's shape now? Well, first of all, I think we're in quite good shape. I mean, on a scale of one to ten, you'd probably give us an eight or a nine, which, you know, even in MIT is a decent grade. Uh, the thing where we stand out, our faculty is extremely good. I don't want to say exceptionally good because there are probably five institutions or seven that have faculty of a comparable sort, but there certainly aren't ten. Globally or nationally? Globally, globally. No, I mean, the U.S., this is still an arena in which we are pretty well situated. Uh, so the faculty is really quite good. Uh, the students are exceptional. Uh, I do think the undergraduate student body is singular in its makeup. Now, part of it is because we're a specialized institution. We're not a university, I think. Massachusetts Institute of Technology is an important word. There's a big difference between being an institution, being a university. And so a Yale or a Harvard or a Princeton couldn't, they wouldn't want our freshman class because it's too shaped towards mathematics, engineering, science, and so forth, and they wouldn't want as the entering class in Princeton or Harvard or Yale such a concentration of talent in this one domain. Uh, but we have really an exceptional undergraduate group, and I, when you talk to the faculty, one of their joys is teaching these students because they are exceptional. Uh, and I think that our process of renewal, that is the process by which the faculty renews itself, which is the key formula for a great university, is in spectacular shape. I'd give it a 10 out of 10. From everything I've been able to find, you know, our tenuring process makes very few mistakes. It's rare that people who are here who don't gain tenure go elsewhere and do exceedingly well. Uh, it probably has happened, but it is not a pattern, certainly. And as best I could gather, and I've probed on this, uh, it is also rare that, you know, people who we do tenure turn out not to have the promise that was anticipated when they were tenured. So this ability of the faculty to renew itself in quality is exceptionally important because without that, you'd worry about the institution. So students, faculty, 10 out of 10. You have to say we're in great shape. Financially, we're poor. We're poorer than I realized. Some of it's attractive. It's fun to see that we're not living quite as high on the hog as, as others. Uh, but some of it's a little painful. There are things we should do, including deferred maintenance, but more importantly than that, there are academic, substantive things we should do that we don't do for money reasons. 
And from process point of view, we waste a hell of a lot of time making decisions that needn't be made because we're too busy counting the pennies. Uh, and we waste an awful lot of time on that kind of stuff. Uh, decision making is not crisp. And I don't care about that, but I know how expensive it is for a large organization to be slow in its decision making because it means you have lots and lots of people who are fundamentally spinning their wheels and it's, it's expensive to spin your wheels. I, I don't criticize the quality of the decisions taken when they're taken. It's just that we take three months to do things that most people could do in three days. And you got to say to yourself, okay, what happened to the other two and three quarters months of time effort? Uh, and so from that point of view, we're, we're capital poor. So I couldn't give us a 10 on that. I'd give us a five maybe. Uh, which is too, too bad. Uh, we haven't thought about the future very robustly. Um, we're much more likely to extrapolate from where we are today to where we're likely to be tomorrow and likely to be the day after than we are to have a vision and try to interpolate between the vision. There are corporation members who have said to me, I've already mentioned, hey, 20 years from now we're going to be out of business. Interesting thought. There are other corporation members uh, who have said to me, and with good, uh, you know, thought, that look, we're allowing maybe 1,000, 1,100 students per year in. We're rejecting choose a number, 7,000, 8,000, whatever it is, but it's a large number. And most of us would agree that maybe a third of those being rejected, maybe half of those being rejected could in fact come here and be perfectly good students and contribute and so forth and so on. And so then the question is, do we have some responsibility to be larger? because we're short engineers, we're short uh, scientists. Uh, MIT certainly gives a quality education. I don't think you could get a better one. Uh, and do we have some moral obligation to be three times as large as we are? That also is a question. Now, we clearly couldn't afford it. I mean, we, we are the size we are in part because of history, but certainly because of money. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, if we had twice the endowment, I think that conversation would get a little more traction than it does. Uh, but there's a question about that, and I couldn't give us a 10 out of 10 on that kind of issue. Uh, the whole idea of globalization, what does it mean to us? Again, uh, these are arenas where we, I'd, I couldn't say, hey, we're in perfect shape, you know because capital-wise, some of these evolutionary things, we're not at the standard that we would set for ourselves. How much do you think MIT's role in the world has changed over the last 50 years, and how much do you see it changing now and where it's going? Oh, that's a good question, an interesting question. I don't sense that it's changed a lot. I mean, 50 years is a long time. Uh, you know, we were always seen globally as the engineering school. You know, our, our existence is well known. And we have always attracted some of the most talented people from around the world. Uh, that hasn't changed. Uh, I think we've always trained people who contributed to the global uh, economy. You know, I was just this morning talking about the Minister of Finance in Egypt, who's a PhD from MIT, and that's not unusual. When I was in the banking business, you'd be surprised at the number of economists I'd run into in Brazil or Japan or what have you that were MIT trained. We've had a long history with China. I mean, I think there have been people from China coming to MIT and going back to China uh, that stretches way before the communists in uh, 1948, goes back probably to 1900. 
So our role as a place to go for a really great engineering, in those days more engineering than science, education I think hasn't changed. I think it exists today, but I think it did exist 50 years ago and it probably existed before that. Our willingness to take foreign students, train them and so forth continues. I don't think it's changed dramatically. Uh, I think what's changed is our realization that the world's changed. But I don't think our role has changed particularly. And nor, by the way, do I think that the, the world's perception of us has changed particularly. But I do think what has changed is our perception of the world. Let's talk about your life before you first arrived at MIT, which includes <laughs> some time, time about yeah. uh, some time in the rest of the world. Tell us about where you were born and where you grew up and what your parents did. Well, I, I was born in Chicago uh, 71 years ago. Uh, when I was about five and a half, six years old, I went down to Argentina during the war. We were still at war. Uh, during the period the ship on which I went was blacked out. And uh, my dad had uh, worked for Armour and Company, the meat packers, and Argentina was providing a substantial part of the beef for Europe and so forth, particularly right after the war when Europe had basically no food. I don't think people remember, but in 1951, England was still rationing food. Uh, and But anyway, so my dad's job took him back down to Argentina, and my brother, I have an older brother, and I were packed up, and off we went to Argentina. I started first grade there. Uh, was in Argentina until about the fifth grade, and then we went to Brazil. We went to Sao Paulo. Uh, at the time, Sao Paulo was a million people. Uh, now it's about 20. And I used to ride my bicycle down Paulista, which is the main sort of business street in Sao Paulo, and there were nothing but big homes. And you'd ride your bike in the morning, and people would be cleaning the streets. Now they're all big, tall glass buildings and so forth. Uh, and I lived in Brazil from 48 to 51, came back to Argentina and then graduated from high school in Argentina. My family came originally from Toledo, Ohio, my mother and father both. They went to the same school, you know, the girl next door deal. It was real. And uh, I was wonderfully lucky. I had a wonderful family life and great parents and so forth and so on. So I don't have any of the modern day traumas that uh, people talk about. And. Uh, we enjoyed being, and I do think we went to Argentina in good measure because my parents thought that it would be a great place to raise a family, which it was. Uh, my dad went to MIT, uh, class of 24, electrical engineering, got his master's in 25, uh, left MIT and went to work for IT&T, which in those days was actually a telephone company. It was the international telephone uh, company, and for an electrical engineer, a telephone company was a normal kind of thing to do. Uh, and MIT was always important to my dad. Uh, he felt that he had really gotten a great education here, and so I always had MIT magazines around the house. And I could remember my dad was always a member of the local MIT club in Sao Paulo and in Buenos Aires, both. And so the MIT connection was there. Uh, when I was coming to the States to college, uh, my dad said, hey, kid, you're not up to just going, you know, I'd never lived in the States really. And in those days, we came back every third year uh, on a ship. I mean, you weren't flying back and forth, and it wasn't a question. There were, you know, there weren't any telephones. I never once spoke to my grandparents on a telephone or anything like that. It was telex and so forth. And uh, so anyway, it was going to be, and it was, a culture shock to come back to the States. And the, at the time, MIT had a 3-2 program. And the 3-2 program was with 12 identified liberal arts colleges. And so I applied to the 3-2 program. And I chose Washington Jefferson just totally arbitrarily. I didn't want to be on the East Coast because uh, MIT was on the East Coast, since I didn't know anything about the United States, I sort of 
figured I'd go elsewhere. Reed College was part of it out in Oregon, and I was thinking that would be good for my name. <laughs> but uh, Oregon seemed a long way away, and I ended up uh, W&J. Now, no one would know why W&J. It was 600 men only at the time, small liberal arts school. It had played in the Rose Bowl in 1924. Now, my father graduated in 24, so he had heard of it. Now, that's strange, but that's true. And anyway, so I just arbitrarily did it. It turned out to be wonderful. I got a good liberal arts education. It was a very small school in not a wealthy part of Pennsylvania. You know, Pittsburgh is not. So I learned a lot about a world that I had not seen as an expat in Argentina. Uh, it was 100% American. I don't think there was anybody any place close to the school who had ever been any place else. And of course, and I should backtrack, you know, my last part of my schooling, my high school in Argentina, was an American school. Uh, there was, uh, it was uh, the American Community School, as it was called. Uh, there were French schools, there was Scottish school, a British school, a German school, and stuff. So depending where folks were going to go to college, you would point them because the educational systems are different. And so if you wanted to go to England to go to college, you went to St. George's. If you wanted to go to Scotland, you went to St. Andrews and so forth and so on. We sort of collected folks who wanted to go to the state's college. Uh, there were only eight Americans in my graduating class. Everybody else was foreign. And because of my age, we had a lot of Chinese because the 1948 Communist Revolution, there were a lot of refugees who ended up in Argentina. They wanted their kids to come to the States to college, so they would try to get them into the American school. We had a lot of Eastern Europeans who post-war had come to Argentina, and Argentina, as you know, was one of these places where you could get in. You know, people may have wanted to come to the States, but there were quotas, it was difficult, and many people ended up either in Canada, Australia, Argentina, and Onassis came to Argentina after the war, and uh, people think of him as a Greek ship owner, but he started in Argentina. And so anyway, my experience in the American school was a collection of international folks who were pointing their way at coming to college in the United States. And by the way, the great bulk of my class did, and I'm still in touch with a lot of them, and many of them have had very interesting and successful careers all over the world. And But every nationality you could imagine, Eastern European, we had one Egyptian girl in my class, and but a lot of Chinese and so forth and so on, because of this collective time, which doesn't exist. But anyway, uh, Came States, W and J worked well, transferred to MIT, enjoyed it. I took courses. You had to have a minor uh, in those days, and I took course three. I decided which degree to get by where you wrote your thesis, basically. And I debated whether metallurgy, as it was then called, not sophisticated material science. Uh, I debated seriously in my mind whether I would stick with that, but decided, no, I'd, I'd go into a managerial track. And in those days, course 15 was industrial management. It was, you were targeting to be a plant manager. And I left there, went to Goodyear. I'd taken ROTC in school, and so I became a second lieutenant and served in the Army. Great experience. I had troops, and we met as a unit, went to Korea, plugged in and replaced a unit that was there, and came back. Learned a lot about Asia, which I had not been to. Uh, and we had about 1,500 Koreans working, and it was an engineering uh, depot rebuild operation, tear down engineering equipment and rebuild it and so forth. And uh, in, we were just back at the DMZ. And then I, I, I had not intended to go to grad school. I learned what I didn't know and said, you know what, kid, you better go back to school. There's a lot that you don't know. And so I came back here and I sort of negotiated a program with Bill Pons, who was then the dean at the Sloan School, and I sort of said, hey, if I, and of course I understood the catalog and everything, and so I said, hey, if I were to take these courses, would you give me a degree? And we had to negotiate around the corner, but 
in essence, I was able to put together my own track, so to speak. And I was targeting the things that I really felt that I didn't understand, that I wanted to understand. Which were what and types of things? Mainly economics and, and uh, sort of mathematical analysis kind of things, quantitative things. Uh, and it's, you could learn a lot about the world by reading books. It's very hard to learn quantitative things just reading. Some people probably do, but I'm not included. And uh, then uh, I went to work for Citibank. And I went to work Citibank because I thought they'd send me overseas and I'd spend the rest of my life as an expat. <laughs> Let me back you up a minute. Were you good at math and science as a kid growing up and were you drawn not to that? Not exceptionally, yeah. no. Yeah. No, I wasn't exceptionally, I was a, not an exceptional student. I think I was exceptionally curious. Were you a leader? Yes, probably, probably. And I always was enthusiastic about whatever I was doing. And that was a great uh, skill. I mean, once I was in trouble in the Army and I was spent three days washing garbage pails. And I assure you, no one has ever washed them as well. <laughs> I, I, I spent three days, I just decided I was going to wash every garbage pail in Fort Belvoir, which I did. <laughs> and they were going to be awfully clean, which they were. <laughs> and so I, I could get enthused even doing things that one might wonder why one's doing. Did you know what you wanted to do as a career when you were growing up? Did yeah, you have some I, I goal? wanted to run something. I, in those days, I thought I'd run a factory. My idea was I'd be a plant manager. Like of, your father. Uh, yeah, although he hadn't really been a factory manager. Yeah, but something like that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I sort of thought that the big thing to do was to run a factory that made things. And, but uh, it, clearly it was a managerial. You mentioned that there was some culture shock when you came up to college. Oh, yeah. What, what was it like? Oh, it's just social. I mean, if you're raised in a Latin American environment, uh, it's less harsh than the American. The American culture is harsh. Uh, and, you know, it was funny, when I was in Citibank, we always had our international folks and we talked to them about how difficult it was to move. Coming to New York was viewed as one of the hardest moves. I mean, Saudi Arabia and New York were viewed as similarly difficult for families and so forth. And it's the lack of support system, sort of the lack of warmth. Uh, you know, in a Latin environment, the people will surround you more completely and so forth. And the U.S., and particularly for teenagers, you can imagine, uh, it was a pretty harsh environment. And I was a little shocked. And I don't think I talked to a girl for a year. <laughs> and uh, so it was, it was a different world. Uh, the U.S. is a faster-based society, rule-based rather than relationship-based. And, uh, you know, it's, it is notably different, and I, knew, I could even sense it today. I mean, if I go back to Latin America, I in some ways feel more comfortable just in the ambience. It, it's nothing about being there or anything. Uh, it's just a different rhythm. And France has some of that. As you know, I, I had a house in France for a while after I retired. And uh, it's, it's certainly not Latin America, but it has some of that quality about it. What was your major? At, did you have a major at W&J? No, it was mainly I had to do all the math and science and engineering that was required. Uh, W&J, when I had an elective, it was 20th century American literature, but I didn't have a lot of electives. Uh, because we had to do all of the calculus and all of the physics and all of the chemistry. Fortunately, in those days, biology wasn't on the list. How well prepared were you then when you got up to MIT? Did you have the equivalent of two years of math and physics and a year of chemistry, and were, were they of the same rigor that you would have gotten here? Yeah, the rigor wasn't the same, but the learning was the same. Uh, in other words, the process was different. The thing that we, I had no problem, in other words, when I came in my freshman year or my junior year here, uh, you know, I didn't have any particular problem uh, I certainly wasn't the best student, but I wasn't the worst student. Uh, the, uh, 
the thing that was much different was the quality of the other people in the class. Uh, I mean, it was just a different world. And that raised the bar. And the, the intensity, the problem sets, problem sets, problem sets, you know. Thermodynamics was my first sort of 240. Uh, for some reason, I took physical chemistry five something or other, and that didn't seem quite as bad. But thermodynamics, you sort of felt like you were there. And uh, but what I noticed most was the quality of the other students. I mean, it was just a totally different level, and that raises the bar and the intensity and so forth. But I was well prepared. I had enough of the fundamentals so that I felt comfortable. I never felt that I was underwater or anything. I probably worked harder than many in the in the first year trying to, you know, move myself up. Uh, Did you live on campus? No, I lived at 353 Mass Avenue with three other uh, MITers, one from Argentina who I'd known for a long time. And by the way, the people with whom you live help a lot. Uh, and because we all studied together and so forth. So, I'd, and one of my roommates, Joe Antibi, who was in course one, uh, was in grad school while I was an undergraduate. And so when we got stuck, uh, he was around to help. What, what were your first impressions of the Institute? Do you remember? Had you been on yeah. campus yeah, before Yeah, I'd been you on campus here? because Durando, with whom I roomed, who was, of course, 16, uh, he was here, and all of us from our, he's in Argentine, I still see him, uh, all of us from Argentina, we didn't go back home for holidays. In no. those days, one didn't do those things. And so Thanksgiving, Christmas, and so forth, we'd all sort of get together. And we came up here at MIT once and stayed on campus over Christmas. And uh, so I'd been around and so forth. Uh, I'd never seen it before I came to the States for college. In other words, with my parents, I'd never visited. And when my dad came back in, I think it was 1960 or something, it's the first time he had been back on campus since 25. So <laughs> it was uh, quite different. He lived in the East Campus dorms, uh. which I would tell you are still there. When you were at MIT as an undergraduate, did you become involved in any extracurricular activities? No. Nope. Uh, I was really very much here to study and learn. I was totally invisible and basically did nothing other than go to class and then back to my apartment at 353. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I was never engaged in any social activities. I ate lunch with the Latin Americans. There was a table uh, full of primarily Mexicans. Uh, but since I spoke Spanish and all this kind of stuff, I ate lunch with them, and that was the degree to my social involvement. In Walker? Or? Yeah, in Walker. That's where we, I ate all my meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner. In those days, I probably ate a big breakfast, and a big <laughs> lunch, and a big dinner. Inconceivable now. Did you get to know any of your professors? Or any not classes? Re not stand really. No. Uh, you know, I loved physical chemistry, and I took uh, physical metallurgy. I think it was Professor Cohen who was the professor, but he was far too august a figure for me to want to talk to. And uh, no, but I loved it. I enjoyed the, the learning, and I learned a lot. Uh, but no, I, it's funny, I'm now in the corporation and, you know, chairman of the corporation and everything. And I think back and I think there is nothing that anybody could have seen had they been looking for me when I was at MIT. I was invisible. No one knew I came. No one knew I left. <laughs> I didn't stay around to get my diploma. Uh, my father, this says something about my father, who, by the way, was a wonderful figure. But he wrote me a letter. He was in Argentina, of course. And he said, congratulations on your you know, graduation. He sent me the five volumes of Churchill's history of the American-speaking people as a gift. And he said, please remit anything left in your checking account. <laughs> and that I did, needless to say. And I had zero money because I just sent him whatever I had had, and I had to get a paycheck. 
And so you moved out to Goodyear? I drove to Akron in my car, and I'll tell you, between the Monday I went to work and the Friday that I got my first paycheck, I didn't have any money. What was your time at Goodyear like? Did you It was good. Enjoy I loved it? it. Yeah, I loved it. I was in the I was building tires. We were in the plant and we worked around uh, the various, you know, you start unloading crude rubber from box cars and end up loading finished tires. And I got to meet all the people and interesting set of people, a lot of them from West Virginia. And uh, You'd be amazed at how many interesting people were in the labor force, uh, and I had no family, nothing to do except to work, and so I volunteered for all the overtime I could get, so I quite often had 18-hour days. Were you on the assembly line? Yes. No, no, no. This, this was, was hands-on. This was I had to be a member of the union, the United Rubber Workers, in order to be on the on the assembly line. And we were in, in Akron, Ohio. They had six-hour shifts. They had four six-hour shifts. So we'd work a six-hour shift on the assembly line. Then we had two hours of management training afterwards. And uh, but I was very much on the assembly line. I was working. I carried the union contract in my hip pocket, and I gave our foreman a horribly hard time because I knew every little detail of the contract. And uh, but it was really I learned a lot. Uh, I learned a lot about people. I learned a lot about how to make tires. Uh, tires, by the way, are a very interesting product. They're a composite material. The design and engineering of tires is still even today. Uh, very, you know, intellectually complex, uh, and they model them with supercomputers and stuff. Uh, because there are a lot of trade-offs to be made as you build them. They really are an interesting thing. Uh, but I learned something about human beings. Uh, you know, when you're making treads, uh, the rubber goes through a die basically in the form of the tread and the rubber is quite hot and so you take it away on a table and it's, it's showered with cold water until it cools down and then it's measured to make sure that it's right for the, uh, the tires that are being made and often you end up scrapping 50 or 60 yards of rubber because the measurement says hey not right and then you adjust the die but you got this 50 yards of takeaway that has to be scrapped. Uh, you could rework green rubber so it's not totally lost but certainly a lot of money cost. Well we noticed on the machine that when one of the takeaway uh, uh, sort of devices was at a certain angle that we knew things were more likely to be correct than not and so I pointed it out to the foreman that hey we could adjust by just trying to make sure this takeaway is on the right level and the odds are we're going to have a better product and we'll have less scrap. Next time I came that that thing was taken away. The foreman didn't want to get rid of the scrap. Because they had breathing room when they something went wrong. They had breathing room, they had time, but uh, that was my first great understanding that human beings don't necessarily optimize. <laughs> so, you know, I learned a lot. It was a good experience. So when you got to Citibank, did you think, gee, our management trainees should spend some time as cashiers or loan officers? Y yeah. No, no, no. Uh, in the old days, when I joined Citibank, you started out in the back office, typically in the letter of credit department, uh, and, you know, doing the back office sort of underlying paperwork associated with foreign trade. And you went through accounting and all of that kind of stuff. As we started hiring people from business schools, they were a little uppity and they didn't want to do those things. And But, you know, some of our best leaders when I was at the bank were people who had started out in the back office. And Jamie Dimon, one of Jamie Dimon's good qualities at uh, J.P. Morgan Chase now is he knows the details. He's okay. done it all. And he brings that to his desk every day. And so learning the basics is not a bad idea. How long did you 
work on the tire in the I was tire only company? I was only there for about nine ten months because you knew you were going well, to no, have the, to go see into when the you graduate I, gra I had gone to ROTC when you graduate they will guarantee that you'll be called up within 12 months I see and so I was called up in March and so I had graduated in June and so I jo went to Fort Belvoir on March 1st and there you had the engineering work. And yeah, career. and then you, you go through training, basic training, and all of that kind of stuff. That's when I was washing garbage bales. But, uh, <laughs> different lessons from, different from lessons, your yeah. experience there? And then I was assigned to pick up a unit of people, train them in Columbus, Ohio, and then we went to Korea to replace an equivalent unit that was facing back. And at the end, you mentioned that you decided you had more to learn, and you oh, came yeah, back no, to. Oh yeah, no, I did a lot of reading when I was in Korea, as you might imagine, and uh, I just decided there was an awful lot that that I would benefit by going back to school. So I did. Did MIT and Sloan seem very different to you after your experience in Ohio and in the, Ar in, yeah. in the Army? Yeah, no, I was more mature than most. Uh, most kids in those days finished undergraduate, went straight in to get their master's degree. And of course, I'd been out, and I'd been out in the real world, which is different. And uh, yeah, I was clearly a little older in many ways. and saw the world a little differently. And instead of avoiding professors, you went right to the dean and said, here's what I'm interested in. Well, yeah, in. and the dean, yeah, I went back to school. I knew exactly what I was trying to learn. And it's funny, I pulled the, my letter that I wrote Citibank when I was applying for a job. I was very specific. I said, this is what I've learned, this is what I know, and this is what I want to do. And, you know, I gave him a list of things I thought I knew and understood. And quite, I don't think I've ever seen a letter like that since. <laughs> so it made a difference. It's funny, I got a job working for Riston that I would not have gotten had I just been one of the Less 100 specific. people that they hired that year. But you actually applied to more places than just Citibank. Yeah, yeah, no, I applied to a number of places. Uh, and in those days, you interviewed companies. They were lucky to be able to hire you little different than today and uh, because for some reason MBAs were in great I say MBA we weren't MBAs in those days we had a master of science degree and you had to write a thesis and everything but uh, I the two companies that most interested me was Standard Oil of New Jersey now Exxon and uh, City and City appeared to me to be much more flexible, which in retrospect it is. I mean, I think Exxon's one of the best managed companies in the world, but uh, it is not flexible. And City was. And so I did end up in the right place. You wrote in an essay a few years ago that you also saw City as a place that was aspirational. Very much so. No, what no, did no. you mean by that, and why was that important? Well, you know, I've always been one of these people who sort of tries to identify what you might be and then sort of figures out how to get from here to there. Uh, many people think linearly, where are you today and what can I do tomorrow that's a little different? And I, I tend not to do that. And city wanted to be something different than it was. They were, quote, building businesses. The most positive thing that could be said about a person's career at city was that he had built a business or she had built a business. And uh, it wasn't a question of running a business. It was a question of building a business. And uh, we were expanding overseas uh, really intensely. Uh, and of course overseas was what I was all about. I wanted to go back overseas. And I joined the overseas division at Citibank. And uh, so it was this, you know, pioneering spirit of doing something different and so forth that uh, was attractive to me. Very different than Exxon, which, you know, looks for new oil, but they basically want to find oil, take it out of the ground and move it around. Tell us about your career there and some of the highlights. First of all, it was fun. 
And I think one of the things that is true of me, and it was true of most of the people of my generation, the thing that made it most fun, a little bit like MIT, was the people with whom you worked. It was a, you know, a really interesting, bright, diverse, very global uh, organization that uh, the dominant culture was sort of working together and getting things done. You know, we had Indians and Pakistanis working side by side, Jews and Muslims, and we never had any problems. Uh, what was going on in the global stage? And didn't, we had a lot of Palestinians because uh, a lot of the better educated Palestinians had no sort of roots, and they ended up with companies like a Citibank. And yet, they're, you know, we were just all city bankers, and so that was fun. Uh, you know, I was lucky. Uh, Riston and Spencer were running the place. Uh, you know, I joined the bank and uh, to work in the overseas division two years after I was there. The head of the overseas division became the chief executive of the officer. That was Walter Riston. Walter Riston. And, you know, I had worked as sort of his personal handyman. He said, I'll empty my wastebasket on your desk in the morning and you could sort of shuffle through it. <laughs> and. Um, you know, there were some things that I knew quite a bit about because of my education at MIT that were not particularly known at the time. So I brought new capabilities to the company, something that is not true today. A graduate of the Sloan School today won't know anything that isn't already within the companies, which is too bad. But. Uh, uh, I probably helped quantify the management of MIT. We had no budget when uh, of MIT city. of City. Yeah. Uh, we had no budget when I joined. One of the first things Riston had me do when he became president was create a budget process for the uh, bank. For the bank, our earnings were what the accountants told us our earnings were at the close of the year. And this was in the this late was, 60s. This was 1965. Mid 60s. Yeah, and but we. One of the first things I did that caused Mr. Riston to like me was I would tell him what the earnings of the overseas division were before the chairman knew. And so he could tell the chairman, by the way, this month we earned X. And lo and behold, the chairman would be very surprised to discover a week later that we, in fact, had earned X. And that was because I had gotten into the bottom of the accounting system and I knew all the accountants and I figured out how we calculated these various things. And I would give Riston a, a forecast of what I thought the earnings would be each month, uh, which we didn't have. And so forth and so on. And while I was in the overseas division, I helped him create, quote, a language. Uh, to sort of run the place. Uh, and that language still, when I left uh, 10 years ago, was there. And so when he became president, uh, I spent two to three years building the language, if you will, that we use for running the place, uh, which was a pretty robust and good uh, language. I care a lot about, you know, numbers and so forth and so on. Uh, then uh, Riston asked me to help the company think about how computers would impact banking. Uh, that caused me, number one, to try to understand what was going on in the world of computers, something that I didn't necessarily know. Uh, and I spent a year running around the country talking to people in computer companies and so forth and so on, getting a sense of what was going on. And then we embraced uh, the idea that what was going to be most important to us were online, interactive, real-time systems. And uh, then we tried to figure out how we could bring such thinking and capability into the company. and. We ended up buying, uh, doing some startups. Uh, I was the first occupant of this building that MIT now owns in Kendall Square, the tower there. I think it's one Broadway. And uh, we've created something called City uh, Bank Systems, Inc., CSI. And then we merged it with a company in California, in Santa Monica, and moved from here to, to California. Frank Newman, who later became head of uh, Bankers Trust, was one of my first software guys at CSI. 
and uh, we brought sort of this idea, which in its most conventional form takes the form of cash machines today, which is an online interactive sort of system, and we sort of brought that into banking through this. But we did an equivalent thing on the corporate side with funds transfer and where corporate treasurers could move money around the world using terminals in the corporate treasurer's office. And it didn't take a genius to figure out that this same computational capabilities would be useful in the back office of the company, which, if you recall, in the 70s was going through a real paperwork crisis. And it was one of the few places where Mr. Perot didn't do well. And uh, But anyway, I was then asked to run our back office. And if you had looked at the history of the people running our back office, you could tell, number one, that it was in trouble because there had been about six people in about six years, which is a sure sign that things aren't working. And number two, that it was a big problem. And so I got into the back office and we reconceived it. It had been thought of as sort of green eye shade accountants in your back office. The name itself says everything. It was physically behind the platform where you would deal with customers and then you had your, quote, back office. Uh, and we, it didn't take a long time because of my youth and so forth and so on to see it quite differently. This was a, a flow, a processing flow of transaction processing and you should view it as you'd view an oil refinery. You want to get the product through and so forth and so on. And so we reorganized the place totally into flows and we put people in charge of the flows and then we started automating uh, pieces that could be automated and and we did a lot of things that were interesting and uh, things that you only do when you're young uh, you know we couldn't get NCR which was one of the big su suppliers of equipment or IBM to give us the equipment we needed and we said to hell with you and we started uh, putting out requests uh, for others to build equipment because in those days the major equipment manufacturers said we don't care what the customer thinks this is our product line you choose the product that you most like and we said we don't these products aren't going to do what we want and so we started specifying we want a check sorter that could sort at this pace and so forth and so on and you know we were moving big money through the back office uh, so an hour made a difference and uh, because you know you were collecting this money and interest rates were not what they were today, they were higher. And uh, so we totally reconceptualized the back office. Uh, Mostly out of your head and you looked at it or did well, were you, were there experts Well, it's anybody around? from MIT would have seen it the same way. It I mean, we were just, uh, we saw it as a system. And, you know, I'd been trained to think that way. Uh, and I hired a bunch of guys mainly out of Ford Motor. And uh, the finance side of Ford Motor was thought at the time to be very good. And I hired a bunch of guys. And that's the other thing. Uh, I was the first person to bring in outside talent. Uh, and we brought in people who wanted to run a back office uh, and for whom this wasn't, you know, sort of a clerical function to which you had been delegated because you didn't have any social skills. Uh, which is how most people got into the back office at banks. Uh, interestingly, and this is just an aside, parallel to me was Mr. Bloomberg, who was at was Salomon Mike, Brothers, right? and he was automating, and I met uh, when he was there. And then he was lucky enough to be fired and decided that he'd start his own company and he's doing a lot better than I am and it's too bad for MIT because if I had his money we wouldn't have the capital problems that we have. <laughs> uh, but in any event, so I went through Johns this Hopkins period. In better shape Johns Hopkins than it would has be. benefited. But, uh, so we, I did the back office thing, and then, uh, and as you could tell, the bank was uh, wrist and protected me from the wolves. And, you know, we had problems, as you could imagine. There was an attempt to unionize the company, which I was engaged with. And uh, we 
had one week where we were unable to provide the Federal Reserve with the weekly reporting member banks uh, numbers because we couldn't close the books because I had destroyed the accounting system for a day or two. Uh, when you change things, you know, sometimes there's fallout. And Did you uh, know that would happen? Do no, you give the no, Fed no, a heads? No. Just, well, when it happened, we called the Fed and right. they were perfectly okay. But uh, there'll be an asterisk in the weekly reporting member bank. <laughs> you'll be able to find an uh, estimate for National City or whatever. And even before Riston, I mean, it was George Moore. George Moore, he was, was pretty. He was very visionary. Riston was too, very yes? uptight, very disciplined, but extremely permissive of young people. Uh, George Moore was a live wire. George Moore was a free spirit. And of course, he had Stillman Rockefeller, who was the last of the, you know, straightforward, you know. But, uh, and there was Bernie Stott was there, who was an MIT graduate, uh, electrical engineer, and he was the comptroller of the bank, and he once saw me without my suit coat on and sent me home. He said, if you can't be properly attired, we don't want you at work. He said, I have my breast rat on. <laughs> and he didn't work. He, he was a tough, uh, talk about an mit -er who was straight. But in any event, uh, we did the back office. That worked out. And, you know, we really turned the place around. And it's funny, John Thane told me that Goldman saw what had happened and used it and said, you know what, these guys are right. And they started and they have the best back office at Wall Street today. And I never knew that any of those ideas had This permeated. was Weinberg and Whitehead? It must have been probably. before Weinberg, probably, I would guess. Uh, it could have been John. I, I knew John quite well. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, but in any event, uh, then I went to my then boss, Bill Spencer, who worked with Riston, and said, hey, Bill, Riston had reorganized the place along customer lines, which, by the way, turned out to be a genius decision. And he had made that decision in 67, something like that. And so we had taken what had been a more traditional organization that was sort of uh, product line oriented and geographically oriented and we switched it to customers uh, and I went to my boss Spencer and said you know the retail side of this doesn't make any sense we hadn't qu the corporate side we had organized into customer units but the retail side we still had the metropolitan branch system and then we had finance companies and it was arranged in a very strange way and I said to Bill I said hey this doesn't make any sense and he said okay smart guy uh, <laughs> you dropped the job you're currently in. I was one of five executive vice presidents at that stage. And uh, you run around the world and tell us what we should do. So I did. I spent a year running around the world trying to figure out what we were doing. And together with a couple other people. Uh, with confidence that you'd come up with something, that, yeah, that no, there was no, a better no. way, yeah, there, whatever I, it was. You know, I just sort of felt that, you know, and you know, if I was wrong, he was going to say, sorry, kid, you're wrong. And Bill was tough. And it, you didn't get hurt at Citibank if you had an idea that didn't work. I mean, you didn't have to hide. If you thought you had a good idea and it didn't turn out to be a good idea, no one killed you. But they were willing uh, to invest the time. They said, they spend Apparently, I mean, they took an executive vice president out of his job and floated him around. The, strange, you know. But anyway, so I did, and we came back, and I said, hey, this is how we might organize the consumer group, and I went to the board, made a presentation. We did, and I ran the consumer group for 10 years, and that was fun. I mean, we were right as to what we were doing. We built a great business, and my greatest regret was that I wasn't able to sort of stay with it and make it happen. And then they made me chairman and CEO, and I, my job changed. I had to work not on what I wanted to work on, but 
what our problems were, and our problem was cross-border debt. We had the Latin American debt crisis, and you know, Mexico had quit paying uh, interest in 1982, and I became chairman in 84, so we'd already been a year and a half, and everybody had their head buried under the sand. They were pretending that nothing was happening because it was so large that they didn't know how to deal with it. And you know, uh, our exposure at the time was probably 125% of our capital. And so it was a big deal. And, you know, I, you know, was trying to get my mind around this. This was a forbidden subject. No one wanted to talk about it. And I didn't fully appreciate it either because I'd been running the consumer business. I didn't know anything about this. And Victor Menezes, who was a member of the corporation here at MIT, uh, was running Hong Kong at the time, and we had a tradition in Citibank that when a country head came in to head office, they'd always have coffee with the chairman so that you could say what's going on in Hong Kong. And Victor came into my office and said, John, this cross-border debt thing is going to put us out of business. And I said, tell me about it. And he did. And so I started looking at it. And he was right, and it wasn't that I hadn't known about it, but I wasn't quite so fixated with it until Victor said this. And I have this quality, which has served me well in life, that when people give me bad news, I accept it. Uh, you know, I never say, oh, that isn't true, forget it, go away. My instinct is to accept it, and then sometimes I find out that it isn't. But I start out assuming that people who talk to me are, in fact, correct. And uh, the, so we got our mind around the cross-border debt problem, and it's really funny because in the middle of this, uh, I picked up the phone, and I called Victor, and, and uh, uh, he was running Hong Kong in Hong Kong, and he wasn't there, but I said to his secretary, tell Mr. Menezes that I called, and would he please give me a call? And Victor came in and said, somebody's joking with me, because he was four levels down in the organization. And the chairman didn't call me, really, and it took him a while to figure out that I had. <laughs> And then he called me back and I said, Victor, I want you in New York and you're going to help me work on this problem. And he did. He came back to New York and he and I worked on it. Bill Rhodes was the principal uh, horse, but Victor and I worked on it hard. And twice in his career, Victor played that role with me where he gave me bad news that turned out to be right. But we solved the cross butter debt problem, it took 10 years. and. Then we ran into the real estate crisis, which I, I learned an awful lot. And that was a period of time where we really might have been in serious trouble. This was in the 70s then? In the 90s. In the 90s. In the 90s. This, oh. Yeah, this was uh, 1991. And right. we were short capital because of the cross-border debt thing. Our capital, you know, when we took the $3 billion reserve and so forth. And then we really had to pull the company together, but we did really quite well. Uh, but it was a real crisis. And that's when I said, self, you know, <laughs> it might be best for the company if they were to fire you. And I had a sort of week where I wasn't very happy about that prospect. And then I sort of woke up one morning and I said, you know what, I didn't lie, I didn't steal, didn't cheat. This isn't a mm -hmm. moral issue, this is a business problem that maybe I can't solve. And there's no sin involved. Uh, if I can't, I can't, but it's not good or bad. It's okay. just you were given a problem set that you were unable to solve. And so I said, let's not worry about it. Let's just see what you could do. Why with your penchant for looking at metrics and tracking things, could something like that even occur? And I don't know if that applies to the current recent financial crash. In other uh, words, people track things, and yet there are still things that escape. Yeah, the, the real estate thing at City was, uh, just an error of judgment, uh, you know. The person running our corporate bank, who I had put there, 
came to the conclusion that's correct that you can't make any money from big companies. And you know, the solution would have been to shrink down your business. But very few people come and suggest that you shrink down businesses. And so they were looking at ways of earning a decent return. Uh, and you know, the places where you could get good returns are typically risky. The three places where banks historically get in trouble are real estate ships and airplanes. <laughs> and because you tend to finance them all, and during good times they're perfectly good, uh, but when there's a slowdown they tend to really change in price. And we built up a pretty good real estate business, and I must say I didn't pay much attention because the company was running well, the head of our credit policy unit thought everything was fine and so forth and so on. And then when the balloon went up, which uh, what happened is the economies around the world were getting a little overheated and central bankers started raising interest rates and of course that tipped the economy. It started in Australia and it went from Australia to the States, to Canada, to England, to the continent. And uh, But uh, I wasn't paying much attention. I was relying on our guys on the corporate side to keep their eyes on it. I knew much more about consumer credit than I did about corporate. And we had a real crisis in our hands. And, but I certainly owned it. Yeah. You seem to be able to think out of the box. Is there a way to cultivate that approach? Is it easier to do when you're higher or lower in a chain of command? And are there ways to convince others that the results aren't wacky? Well, you, you need an environment that tolerates it. So right away, you know, had I gone to work for Exxon, I doubt seriously that I would have developed that because I don't think the environment in Exxon, and maybe the industry, doesn't lend itself to that. Uh, so you need an environment that's open. Uh, where people are willing to listen and take chances and so forth and so on. Uh, you also have to hire people who have that spirit. You have to attract, you know, when we were running City, we said hire anybody who looks bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. We don't care if they're a violinist or a mathematician. We could teach them finance. But if they're interesting people and, you know, got a lot of energy, a lot of get up and go, let's hire them. And so we built up a really great set of people who were willing to be entrepreneurial and take risks. And, but we also had a culture that tolerated it. Uh, and, but you have to foster that kind of culture and you also have to press people to think out of the box and give them permission to think out of the box. Uh, some people aren't going to ever do that. Uh, but it, it's a great quality and of course we're trying to build new things and you don't build new things uh, by thinking linearly. Th that kind of thinking probably characterizes at least some of the research at MIT. Um, I, I wonder a lot of it. <laughs> to what extent it carries over into the administrative jobs and the management. I would guess it doesn't. I'm just guessing. You know, I've been around here through probably four or five administrations. Maybe Jerry Wiesner mm. was somebody who saw MIT more broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you have a great decision in a negative sense. Uh, I think Howard Johnson was the one who said no to a medical school. And that was a great idea. I mean, is having said yes would have been <laughs> a real jump. Uh, but the point is, what I think, other than those two examples, I don't recall Open administrations. Maybe? Pardon? Open courseware, maybe? Or, uh, uh, that was an interesting innovation. I'd be curious at where it came from. I think it came from the Mellon Foundation, and it was Art ah. Store and all of this, a Bill Bowen. But somebody said yes. Yeah, I think. If, I don't know the history. You'd have to ask yeah. Chuck Vest. But I. Chuck Vest told me about the open courseware idea. Mellon gave us the money. My sense is and that it was, was Mellon who approached us. 
uh -huh. with the idea. But I'm not right. sure of that. You'd have to ask Chuck, yeah. maybe it was his. Or even a decision like the one to look into the women's space at MIT. Oh, that's, those kind of initiatives we've had. I do think we're curious and we look at things. And we're d willing to deal with facts. You know, if, if we don't have women, that's a fact. And it's worth looking into and figuring out why. And we're worried about minorities and mm -hmm. the professorship right now. And that, again, is being looked at. There, I think we're quite good. But I can't remember uh, an administration at MIT that sat back and said, number one, can we rethink the whole school, which would be some, or could we just rethink the administrative process, how we run the place, and mm -hmm. could we do so in a way that was lighter? Those would be interesting things to do. You know, our central service organizations cost, and we could argue about numbers, but they cost something in the order of $200 million a year. That's $4 billion of the endowment, okay? That's for the central service organizations. And one could ask oneself, gee, you know, a lot of it is medical and IT support and accounting and HR and so forth and so on. Uh, one could ask oneself, could we somehow access these kind of services? And it, it would have to be a totally different way. It, wouldn't, it couldn't be just doing what we're doing today more effectively. It clearly wouldn't go to zero. You're just no, no, no. About it wouldn't go to zero. But is there an alternative? Significant. Well, this is this question, and we learned this at Citibank as well. Uh, you know, in the consumer business, we were trying to develop consumer systems in India or in Chile that could be brought back to the states. And the point was that the people who were working on these problems in those kind of environments just lived in a very different cost structure. And so the ideas that would stem from these places when applied in the states turned out to be very cost effective. And the question you'd have to say to yourself, and this is why the Indian question comes up, could you create an MIT in India that would allow to have $10,000 tuition? And okay. so the question is, could you imagine Terry Stone's part of the institute, not Raphael's part of the institute. Executive but Terry's vice president for executive vice president for operations, operations finance. finance, whatever. But she runs the day to day, and could you imagine satisfying those needs differently? It would be an interesting thought experiment. A few years after you left City, you took on the uh, stock exchange job. Um, what what was that about? And uh, well, the stock exchange had a crisis. They had this problem with having seemingly paid their chairman too much money, and uh, there was a big fuss about it in the press. And for reasons that are still not 100 percent clear, the chairman left. Uh, and I got a call on a Friday. Uh, from a friend and who was on the board at the stock exchange and said, John, we have this crisis. It's really a crisis of credibility because we've had this big to-do about compensation. And we and the chairman, Mr. Grasso, had left. And uh, this was Friday. He had resigned, I guess, at a Friday meeting or been fired. I don't think it was ever legally decided which. and. Uh, and they were confronted with the need to bring somebody in who had some credibility and yet who was somewhat knowledgeable and so forth and so on. And they said, would you be willing to do it? And I sort of felt, look, I'd had a wonderful career. I was having fun in my retirement. I loved it. But I probably felt a little guilty that I had done so well. And, you know, this was payback time. And so I went to my wife and I said, hey, Cindy, what would you think if I went back to work for a while? And she said, look, if you think that's the right thing to do, we'll do it. And so I said yes, and I became chairman of the stock exchange. And my job really was to sort of clean it up a little bit, obviously redo the whole corporate governance side, and we changed the board and the, and the bylaws and all that kind of stuff, and then find a successor and get out. 
And so I went in, we were successful in doing that. I found John Thane, who I had met through the corporation at MIT, and who was at the time at Goldman as president. And uh, he came in to run the place. And that was a transaction in my life that I view as having been a success because I was brought in to get something done. We got it done. Uh, John Thane was a first class successor. He did a spectacularly good job. And uh, I was able to re retire. <laughs> so it was sort of an episode. I learned a lot about the stock exchange, as you might imagine. And I learned a lot about the SEC and a little bit that I hadn't already known about the legal systems in the U.S. <laughs> but. MIT has spent several years tightening its budget, some of it as a result of the financial market problems and the plunging endowment. Um, but in an interview with the faculty newsletter recently, you said that if MIT were a company, you would probably be able to identify more savings in the way it's run, but that as a university, we're not going to be as efficient as the company. Would you elaborate on that? Well, you know, we're trying to create, an, I mean, what we really have to say is, is you know, we're a hosting organization. We host our faculty who attract students. We create an environment where the faculty wants to be here. The students love being here. We have to provide sort of physical facilities that attracts them. And our objective here is to create an environment where the best faculty want to come. And we could be pretty sure that if you have the best faculty, you're going to have the best students. And I don't think that you try to create that kind of environment with the same P&L disciplines that you would have in a stockholder-owned corporation. It's a different business. Uh, I'm sure that Bell Labs, when it was run as Bell Labs, was not run with the same discipline of Western Electric or the various operating companies. I'm sure there was a yeah. quite different discipline um, because they had different purposes. They were trying to get different things done. So my feeling is, look, we're, we're in the business of, of creating and disseminating intellectual capital, if you will. And so we need to create that kind of environment. And, you know, efficiency is, is possibly detrimental to that. Now, I do think Terry Sohn's side of the shop could be run with some discipline, but Raphael's side of the shop, I think we want to create the right environment and make sure that we have the right incentives and the right creativity and so forth and so on. And are you satisfied with the metrics that exist to look at MIT in all respects, both in terms of the financials, but also in terms of excellence and whether it's as good as it should be or whether there are gains of the sort you want? You know, I look at it from the point of view of the corporation, not the administration. In other words, Susan may need metrics that I don't because they're not, you know, of relevance to us. Uh, I think we're reasonably good on the quality of sort of the faculty and the students and so forth and so on. Interestingly, we say almost nothing to the corporation about our research activities. We talk to them from time to time about where the money comes from, you know, so much from NIH and so much from here. But we don't say much about what we do. I doubt that there are many members of the corporation who could estimate how many people here on campus are involved in research. The number would be about 4,500. Uh, we have more postdocs than we have faculty, and they're here because of research. Uh, so I would argue that we neither have metrics nor language to talk about that. And on the financial side at the corporation level, I'm not talking about what Raphael has and so forth and so on, but at the corporation level, I would argue we also have not really talked about our capital 
needs and structures and so forth and so on, nor have we talked very much about where we're going. Uh, you know, you've been around. Uh, we don't talk very much about our imagine where we might be 10 years from now. Uh, and we do in terms of real estate all of a sudden, but not in terms of where MIT might be. Uh, we're beginning to get into this. So I think that uh, in some dimensions we have wonderful metrics. In other dimensions, probably because we haven't, you know, you, you don't have a language to talk about something that you're not worried about. And I think there are some areas where we probably need new language and new metrics. And by the way, there are things you can describe that you can't measure. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't describe. Well, you and the corporation are certainly very involved with the oversight of the departments through the visiting committee yep. structure, which would include some sense of, is this department where it ought to be reputationally, academically, I mean, it's part of what you get from having some professors from other colleges on the committees. Um, and I so think we it, get all that. Yeah. No, I think we're very good that's at what I'm that. Saying. But uh, what we don't, even the visiting committees don't usually report on research. Not explicitly. Yeah, they, yeah. they never say, gee, the physics department is wonderful right. because they've had these great advances in the understanding of right. cosmology or whatever they're worried about. But if a department ranking were slipping, that would certainly be that would something be, yeah, that ended would, up on that the... That would just certainly be part of it, no as question. As a proxy. No, it would be a proxy. You also had some interesting observations in, in that faculty newsletter interview about faculty salaries. You, you noted that at top universities, uh, faculty are paid far better than they used to be decades mm -hmm. ago and have moved up in the income distribution in America. Um, some universities, generally not the top tier ones, have tried to cut faculty costs by cutting their tenured faculty and hiring adjuncts. And that's a strategy that's being used in much more limited ways in the top universities, but, but has crept in in certain areas. Do you see change ahead on I this hope area? not. I hope not. I, I go back to this idea, our basic reason for existence is to have the faculty. And, you know, I'd rather go out and raise money than start cutting the faculty. I mean, there are two ways of solving the problem. One's revenue, one's expense. I'd rather go for the revenue. Uh, and because, you know, the reason we're here, the distinction that we enjoy comes from the quality of the faculty and the renewal process and so forth and so on. I don't think we should start fussing with that. Uh, whether we could use, you know, we use TAs. Uh, we have for many, many years recitation classes and so forth and so on. So there's there's a mix and whether we could have instructors as they tend to more in the humanities, but uh, in the math department they have a lot of uh, instructors and so forth who typically are postdocs. But uh, the uh, whether we could find a mix that would allow us to maintain our, our mission that might be a little better or not, always worth an experiment. But I don't think the objective should be to cut costs. Uh, you know, I'd rather close down a particular activity totally and just say, hey, we can't afford to do that, than I would to start, you know, fussing around the edges. You're a trustee of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and an overseer of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. How do you think about the arts at MIT? They're really better than I knew. They're really better than I knew. I mean, I've just become, and we're having, by the way, a visiting committee in the next two weeks, uh, which I'm looking forward to on the arts. And, uh, you know, our students, come here with a tremendous musical capacity and in some instances with a broader artistic capacity. And these students bring with them an interest that they want to nurture. And uh, so it seems to me that 
and th maybe this is something Jerry Wiesner was particularly close to, but th this is something that's important to us. And we have, I believe, a pretty strong uh, commitment to the arts here. And my guess is we'll strengthen it. I think it'll be. And I think it's important to student life. I mean, if you had to choose between an orchestra and a swimming pool, I'd go for the orchestra. Uh, you know, others would rather go swimming. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the point is I think it is very much a part of the intellectual, emotional sort of environment that we want to have. In a an essay for the book Restoring Trust in American Business, which I think MIT Press published I about so. five years ago, you said that all is not well in corporate America and you express concern that the trust and confidence essential to free market capitalism had been severely harmed. It was at a time when American industry was showing its most unethical side. Uh, mm. There were the Enron and WorldCom uh, scandals. Do you think ethics can be taught and do you have any sense of how much it is taught either at the Sloan School or across MIT and science or other areas? Look, I, I certainly think it can be taught. Uh, I'd rather have your parents start. I mean, it's, it's nice to start early. Uh, it would be hard, I think, if somebody arrived at MIT with no ethics for us to instill them. But on the other hand, as you mature and as you grow up and as you start doing serious work, there's no question that there's ethical standards and moral behaviors that, you know, are accepted or not accepted. Certainly any of our laboratory biologists know full well that, uh, you know, their research requires that they, you know, respect data and so forth and so on. And the professional standards with regard to those kind of things in the academic world are pretty tight. I mean, if people start fussing around with data and papers and so forth, they lose their position totally. I mean, they're basically banished. Uh, and so the standards are rigid, and you must learn those as part of your more mature education. Uh, the business schools have done less well in that, uh, maybe because the standards are less rigid. I mean, you could be quite disciplined as to how one behaves in biological labs, and you might spend your entire mature career in such labs where those disciplines hold. You go out into the business world, it's a little more mixed up. Uh, and there is a selfish side to capitalism that seems alive and well. Uh, and it's amazing to me how in some business situations greed is simply part of the deal. I mean, people are in it for their own uh, economic or social. Uh, sort of payoffs, and that seems to be accepted. And maybe it helps the system work. It's not very pleasant to observe. Uh, you know, one thing I saw in the New York Stock Exchange, you know, a penny a share is worth $5 billion a year. And let me tell you, most of the Wall Street firms would be quite willing to take a penny a share from their customers in exchange for $5 billion. Uh, and, you know, treating customers properly, in my mind, is number one responsibility, but there's been a lot of customer abuse uh, in the industry and in business. So I think the business schools have not done the kind of job that you've seen in the scientific disciplines. You know, I think in science there's a set of moral values and ethical values, and people are increasingly very sensitive about human subjects and experiments and even in social science experiments. In other words, uh, in ex I've been involved in some things where people are trying to understand how people make decisions with regard to mortgages. And there's a lot of discipline in not 
uh, doing experiments that might mislead people and, and so forth and so on. So in the scientific community, in the social sciences, in the physical and engineering side, I think ethics is part of the educational process. I think it's well absorbed and I think it's, it's tightly disciplined. Uh, I think the business schools are, they don't tend to emphasize it not 100% clear to me that many of the professors would be in a position to say anything very intelligent about it, most of them having never been out in this particular environment, and hence they wouldn't lack and they wouldn't have credibility with the students. Uh, you know, I gave some courses uh, at Sloan and they were very well attended. And some of my friends over there were professors said the reason everybody's there is everybody aspires to be you. No one aspires to be a professor. And they came not because they thought I had much to say, but they wanted to see what they considered to be a model of what they might be. And. Uh, and so the ethical thing would be better taught by people who had been out in the real world where the students could identify with them more than, you know, a theoretical uh, sort of version. But uh, that's sort of my sense. It's more difficult to teach to business students than it is to scientists. You mentioned earlier that decision making here was not crisp. I think that was the word. That's correct. Can, do you think it could be more so? What did you have in mind? And is that something that's tied to faculty coming together to make decisions, which is not speedy, but there, I, I it mean, gets you something in it's, other ways? It's hard to say. Uh, it's very clear that we take a fairly long time to make decisions. In other words, we'll talk about doing something and, you know, quite a bit later we'll get around to doing it. There's an element which I'm sure comes from the academic environment which is appropriate of getting by it. And you know, we used to do that in business too. We used to, when we were interviewing candidates, have them interview five or ten people within the company and often at the end of the process the candidate would say, why do you guys caused me to interview 10 people, can't you figure out whether I'm any good or not? And you'd say, hey, you don't realize it, but if 10 people say you're really good and why don't we hire you, when you come to work here, you're going to have 10 people who are invested in your being here and you're going to have a heck of a lot better time with your job than if we had made the decision and just plopped you into the organization. So, you know, getting by and causes you have to spend time to get it. And, but on the other hand, I do think that we are not aware of the cost of doing things slowly. Example, and this involves nothing academic. We're very proud that we closed our June 30th books in the middle of September. We're not going to use the information in that closing. It's not worth it. We're not publicly quoted. We don't have to tell our stockholders what we did during the year. We don't look at our financials to make decisions. So the information has very little time value. But you got to ask yourself what you were doing for three and a half months. You know, most big companies close their books three days at, after the end of a quarter. And they, the process of closing the books at MIT is no different than the process of closing the books at Exxon. Uh, you know, it's an accounting exercise, involves accounting staff, there's no faculty involved in closing the books. And yet, we're very proud and we compare ourselves to other universities with whom apparently we look pretty good. But, but I said to Israel, I said, Israel, I don't care about the timing because we don't use the information for anything anyway, but I'm just wondering if we don't have hundreds of people sort of going around in little circles for three months and couldn't we use that time to be doing something else? And it's very complex, it's down in departments and so forth and so on, but the fact of the matter is, you know, decisions are pretty slow when you take three months to close your books. You know, we have our audit meetings for June 30th stuff. We have the audit meeting in September. Uh, it's strange. And so, you know, I'm observing 
there are reasons Israel is quite conscious of what this is all about. I'm just conscious of the cost. Because, you know, we must have a lot of people doing a lot of stuff that could be done more quickly. And then they could go on and do other things. Which, by the way, it can't be fun either. I don't think this is, in, you know, enriching the lives of anybody. Uh, so there are things that we take time in doing. And I think universities are generally less time conscious. And I don't care about things that benefit from thought. You know, if thinking and cogitating improves the quality of the ultimate decision, then we should take the time to do it. Uh, but I am conscious of the bureaucratic cost of taking a long time to do things. On the subject of time, we are out of it. Good. I thank you for your thoughts. Okay.